Hey everybody, Professor Wills here. So we've been talking about Greek archaic sculpture um, and we've been looking at the guy so far, um, a variety of sculptures depicted in marble. Um, some are ser served as grave markers um, and memorialized uh, fallen warriors and heroes. Um, others Others served um, as uh, statues bearing tributes to goddesses like Athena, as we saw with the calf bearer. Um, but overall, what we learned is the increasing nationalism that we're starting to see in the archaic period that separates it from all of those uh, geometric uh, uh, formed types uh, that we saw in the geometric period in its uh, most early artistic history in um, ancient Greece. So I didn't want to leave the ladies out. So I've got a couple of uh, archaic period sculptures to share with you. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, uh, whereas we're going to be looking at a lot of nudity in Greek art, uh, particularly in males, um, as uh, their culture, of course, celebrated the human body through the Olympic Games and fitness, but also their gods and goddesses take human form. Uh, you often find what they would scholars will refer to as the heroic new type um, to um, really showcase the physiques um, of men in particular, uh, whether mortals or gods, um, but not so with the women. Um, there's only one exception uh, we'll learn about later, um, the goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite, but um, for everyone else, uh, females are generally speaking fully clothed. So without uh, keeping you waiting, let's go ahead and pivot to our PowerPoint and I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so just as a quick flashback to our previous video lecture, we met Kroisos. Kroisos we know by name because there's a dedication on this marble um, sculpture that's approximately life-size. And with this particular sculpture, um, you find that it was once painted, there are traces of paint on it, but it is relatively typical of this uh, archaic period where you have old conventions, um, very frontal pose with arms bound to the side. They um, also try to enliven the figure with a suggestion of movement with that foot almost slid forward. Not quite a, a walking, description of walking. Um, we don't see a bend of the knees. The knees are side by side and locked together. Um, but that is a very typical kind of look. It's something that the early Greek artists and sculptors borrowed from Egypt of all places. Um, and for the Egyptians, it was a, uh, um, a formulaic look that endured from all the way through from the Old Kingdom all the way to the New Kingdom. However, in archaic period Greece, we're gonna see them start to break away from that and really pursue naturalism um, in a variety of ways. Um, first of all, you might notice that the physique um, is becoming increasingly naturalistic. We, uh, in our last lecture, talked about the leaps and bounds, even within a few decades of uh, physical naturalism. Not only are they getting the proportions right, but you have the whole kind of anatomical structure correct. You would get a sense of uh, proper proportions for the skeleton, you know, the underlying skeleton, um, and then of course the muscle groupings, and then the sense with a physically fit male, right, of kind of firmness, but then you almost, even though this is a marble sculpture, get a sense of suppleness as well. The only thing that's sort of uh, maybe lagging a little bit behind is a very generic face um, with that archaic smile, which is a meant, uh, it's an, a, kind of a Greek uh, archaic period invention meant to also enliven the face of the subject, but not in a laughter way or, a ha-ha way it is meant just to enliven the face and a little bit of an old school kind of uh, patternized treatment of the hair. All right. Now, in archaic period Greece, in terms of um, the descriptions of female figures, we have the Peplos Cori from the Acropolis um, um, in Athens, Greece. This is where she was discovered um, in excavations around that particular location. She dates from 530 BCE. 
And what you find something um, is a, a lack of a nudity, as I suggested here. Uh, she is wearing a garment thought uh, common in those days called a peplos. It's a, a full length uh, dress of sorts that's sort of cinched at the waist here. Familiar to us is um, another generic face, although it's slightly feminized with slightly finer features. There's that archaic smile once again, and the patternized hair. You can see a little bit of trace of paint on this marble sculpture as well. Um, what you find though is this, and still you have this interest in the human body, even though she is clothed, what you still see the sculptors attempt to do is describe um, the feminine physique, the shape of it by the gathering at the waist um, with the presence of her bust showing through her garment, um, as well as the draping of her coiled hair over her shoulders. Um, it, it describes her curves, um, and more of the rounder, um, less buffed out muscular physiques that we saw with a particular male. So this will continue on through the different um, uh, eras of Greek um, sculpture, uh, where we're going to see uh, women depicted equally with men, just like we see with their gods and goddesses, um, but that the women's uh, clothing will describe the forms underneath their robes as well. So you still get a sense of that interest in physicality and getting that right and as naturalistic as possible. Now, a quarry here, this is called the peplos quarry, is the girl version of a cool rose. So she is meant to be a um, quarry is representing a young female in this instance, whereas a cool rose was a young male. Um, and her arms aren't both side presented down in, at her sides. Instead, um, you have this cavity here, which suggests that she's, well, missing her forearm, but also that it was likely extended outward as if she were holding something. And that's very common in this era. Um, sculptures like this would be holding an object that would tell you something about who that is that you're looking at. So that's called an attribute. So we don't know what that um, arm held, but the attribute probably communicated to the viewer that she is a particular goddess in the pantheon of gods and goddesses um, in Greek culture. We just don't know which one. All right, got one more for you in marble. This one is called Cori. Uh, in Ionian dress, and she too was found at the Acropolis. She's slightly newer, uh, about a decade later, the year 520 BCE, another example of marble sculptures. And again, keep in mind these would have been painted originally. So what you find that with this particular quarry um, is unfortunately she's sustained some damage as well, as we don't see any legs um, so much. Um, but what we do have is this incredible um, multi-layered uh, dress that she's wearing. It's this Ionian style dress, um, which you can see has this off the shoulder look, and then it's kind of multi-layered in these, this complex description of folds and ruffles and scallops. Do you see this? It's got like a, a one layer and then another and then another. So it's this whole kind of asymmetrical look that's in vogue even um, in for today's fashionistas and that it drapes beautifully off the arm. Unfortunately, we have another cavity here indicating that she too likely had her arm extended out and probably held an attribute to tell us which divine being she is. Um, looking um, at her head, you still see that archaic period smile. You still see um, the patternized hair, although boys had a complicated hairstyle. But once again, um, the hair, the way it drapes over the roundness of her shoulders and her bust, as well as that complicated style Ionian dress, still describes the body underneath, even though, again, women remain clothed for the most part in Greek art, um, like sculpture that you see here. So. The Cori and Ionian dress, the Peplos Cori, two examples of female figures 
um, in our Camp Period Sculpture. Thanks for joining me.